O país da liberdade. Um mundo de abundância. A condução, a mediação desse painel vai ficar por conta da VP do IEE, Fernanda Estivalete Ritter. Boa noite. Fomos ensinados que, quanto maior o número de pessoas no mundo, mais escassos os nossos recursos se tornariam. O que vemos atualmente é exatamente o oposto disso. O mundo se tornou mais populoso e o nosso padrão de vida tornou-se imensamente melhor. Mais pessoas produzem mais ideias, o que leva a mais invenções. O resultado desse processo de descobertas são inovações que superam a escassez, elevam o nosso padrão de vida e estimulam o crescimento econômico. Ou seja, uma maior abundância de recursos à medida que a população cresce. Para que esse efeito da superabundância possa acontecer, as pessoas precisam ser livres para pensar, criar, discordar e agir. Precisam estar em um ambiente em que estejam seguras para trabalhar, pesquisar, investir e lucrar. Ou seja, precisam estar em um mundo livre. Alice, na obra tema desse fórum, em poucos minutos acostumou-se com a nova realidade de seu tamanho. E, sem saber o que ela seria nos próximos momentos, não sabia mais o que era certo e como iria seguir o seu caminho. Assim como Alice, podemos nos sentir estranhos em um mundo de abundância e mudanças rápidas, mas é a nossa escolha acostumar-nos a essa realidade em constante evolução. Para compartilhar conosco como nos tornamos imensamente mais prósperos que nossos ancestrais e por que vale a pena acreditar que o mundo das liberdades levará ao mundo das abundâncias, passo a palavra agora para o nosso convidado especial e chama ao palco Marian Tupi. Marian, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much to all of you for coming. I realize that I'm keeping you from your dinner, so I'll try to be quick. But I want to start by uh, saying how delighted I am to be back in your beautiful country. Uh, Brazil truly is a remarkable and uh, uh, stunning place to visit. And I try to do that often. And I want to congratulate especially the organizers of this event, uh, Alan, for taking such good care of me, uh, Victoria, Lucas, and of course, William. So uh, thank you all very much for doing that. Um, our conference started with uh, Father Sirico talking about humans and resources and our use of reason in order to increase the resources that we have. And so it is perhaps appropriate that I will be finishing on the subject of humans, reason, and resources. On November 15th last year, the world's population reached 8 billion people. Is that too few or too many? Well, opinions on this subject differ. The great under-discussed factor in the climate crisis is there are just too many of us and we use too much shit. <laughs> climate deniers like to say, there's no population problem, just look out the window of an airplane, something but empty space down there. But it's not about space, it's about resources. Humans are already using 1.7 times the resources the planet can support. In 1900, there were less than 2 billion people on Earth. Now it's approaching eight. We can't just keep going on like this. The world is just too crowded. There are not enough people. I can't emphasize this enough. There are not enough people. Um, and I think one of the biggest risks to civilization is the low growth rate uh, uh, and the rapidly declining growth rate. Uh, it, is, it is, and yet so many people, including smart people, think that there are too many people in the world and think that the population is growing out of control 
it's completely the opposite. There's scientific consensus that the lives of children are going to be very difficult, and it does lead, I think, young people to have a legitimate question. You know, should is it okay to still have children? So, according to one estimate, global population will peak at about 9.7 billion people uh, in about 2064, and then decline to 8.8 .8 billion people by 2100. To keep population constant, the world has to have, on average, 2.1 children per woman per lifetime. Now, the world's population continues to expand because we still have um, higher than uh, uh, replacement level rate birth rates in sub-Saharan Africa. But in 70% uh, of countries around the world, the fertility rate is already below the replacement level. You can see Brazil over there. Your the total fertility rate is about 1.7, 1.8 children per female, and of course the replacement level is over here at 2.1. So you're not doing well, but you're certainly doing much better than South Korea, where the uh, number of babies per woman per lifetime is lower than one. So what should we think about these trends? Um, the debate uh, over population growth and resources goes back to antiquity, but more recently it was the English prelate by the name of Thomas Malthus who made the concept of overpopulation famous in his 1798 essay on the principle of population. In that essay, Malthus claimed to have mathematically proven that population grows at an exponential rate that's the red line over here, and exponential means 1, 2, 4, 16, 32, whereas resources only grew at a linear rate, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And that's the blue line in the chart. And the difference between these two rates, between the blue and the red uh, rate, Malthus believed, must unavoidably lead to starvation. The debate over population and resources uh, reached a fever pitch in the second half of the 20th century when populations of poor countries, Asia, Africa, exploded uh, thanks primarily to the spread of scientific knowledge and better medical care. In 1968, in 1968, Stanford University biologist Paul Ehrlich picked up the baton of overpopulation in his best-selling book, The Population Bomb. The book sold some three million copies and was translated into many languages. The book started with the following words. This is in 1968. The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Ehrlich scared and scarred generations of people with his ideas turned into feature films, such as the movie Soil and Green. In the movie, the world is so overpopulated and starving that human beings, when they die, are recycled in the form of a biscuit called Soil and Green. Note the date at, uh, on the poster of this movie. So this is what Hollywood thought the world would look like in 2022. What is the secret of Soylent Green? They're making our food out of people. Next thing they'll be breeding us like cattle for food. You gotta tell them. You gotta tell them. Promise, Tiger. I promise. I'll tell the exchange. You tell everybody. Listen to me, Hatcher. You gotta tell them. Silent breed is people. We gotta stop them somehow. 
There is a reason why young people don't like to watch movies from the 1970s. So, we are in 2023 and we are still not eating one another. Instead of starvation, we have an abundance of choices. Outside of war zones, famines have disappeared from the world. In sub-Saharan Africa today, people have access to as many calories as the Portuguese did in the early 1960s. Obesity is a growing problem, not just in advanced countries, but also in sub-Saharan Africa. I've chosen this poster, or rather this picture, because it reminds me of me standing in the supermarket choosing between different types of olive oil from Greece, from Portugal, from um, um, California, from Italy, uh, all sorts of varieties of foods which we have never before. So that's, you know, abundance of choices. So the question is, how did this abundance of choices happen? Accountants, physicists, and biologists measure abundance by counting resources, how much wheat we can grow, how many barrels of oil we can get from the ground, how many pounds of aluminum we can extract. But measuring quantities does not account for technological changes such as, for example, GMO wheat, which delivers bigger harvests on fewer acres of land. Also, measuring of quantities does not account for substitutes. We no longer burn oil in order to produce electricity in power plants. Instead, we use natural gas. And of course, measuring of quantities does not account for efficiency gains. As was previously mentioned, a can of Coke in 1959 weighed three ounces of aluminum. Today, it's only half an ounce. It is therefore much better to measure abundance by looking at prices, as economists do. A rising price of a commodity implies growing scarcity. Falling price of a commodity reflects growing abundance. Prices reflect the behaviors and expectations of 8 billion people around the world. So in a sense, the market is like a giant calculator providing just-in-time estimates regarding what is scarce and what is abundant. But which prices are we to use? You're all familiar with nominal prices. That's the current price of bread, for example, that you see in a shop on daily basis. But you also know that currencies depreciate over time because of inflation. So seeing whether bread got more or less expensive over time, you have to adjust for inflation. And that's how you get the real price. This is a picture of a loaf of bread on sale in Germany in 1922. The price was 1,000 billion Reichsmarks. Now, of course, a lot of people have a problem with inflation measures because they are produced by governments which produce inflation in the first place. But there is an even bigger problem with real and nominal prices. They do not take into account changes in income. And that is where time prices enter the picture. How many times have you heard an older person say, when I was a young man or a woman, things were much cheaper. Well, that is true, but the wages were also much lower. And in normal times, wages grow at a faster pace than prices. This is a boy delivering newspapers for a few dollars a day. This is his older version of himself sitting in the back of a car, maybe reading Wall Street Journal. The point is that over the course of his life, this person has become much more productive. And what is true for individual people is also true for humanity itself. Thousands of years ago in ancient Egypt, we used to harvest wheat with sickles. Today, we harvest wheat using combine harvesters. The point is that we are becoming more productive and consequently, we are getting better paid. So time prices are calculated by dividing the nominal price of a good or a service, that's the one that you see in a shop, 
by the hourly income at the time of the purchase. That's time price. Whereas money prices are measured in dollars and cents, time prices are measured in hours and minutes. Time price simply tells you how long you have to work in order to earn enough money to buy something. We believe that the time price is the true price because, uh, because while we pay, buy things with money, we pay for them with time. Time that we could be spending doing other things, such as playing sports or spending time with our loved ones. So using time prices makes sense for a variety of reasons. First of all, time prices capture both changes in prices but also in wages. They do not rely on government the GDP deflators and other contentious measures of inflation like the CPI. They do not have to be adjusted for purchasing power parity between countries. Time prices are the same globally in the United States and in Brazil. An hour of work is the same here as it is in the United States. And of course, they are true across time so that you can compare prices, how many minutes of work did somebody have to work in order to buy a loaf of bread in Brazil in 1980 versus 2022 or in uh, uh, 1820 and 2022. And time prices are measured in time, which is an independent variable that's not influenced by external factors such as human perception or the environment. Time is universal and constant for general purposes and of course, time is equal for everyone because everyone only has 24 hours in a day. So let's look at a specific example. Ah, so you don't have the latest uh, version of this um, study, but never mind. Okay, let's look at the typical example. This is from the United States. Um, the nominal price of bread in the United States was 50 cents in 1980. By 2022, it increased to $1.56. And that means that bread got 212% more expensive. And this is what you see in the newspapers all the time. In the newspapers, you see things like, prices are at an all-time high. That's because journalists are too dumb to figure out that they have to adjust for inflation. So what happens when you adjust for inflation? Well, 50 cents in 1980 equals to $1.81 in 2022, and we know that bread cost only $1.56, so we can say that bread got 14% cheaper. Let's do this calculation now for time prices. Back in 1980, bread cost 50 cents, an hourly wage of a manufacturing worker, let's say somebody in the manufacturing sector making a car, was $6.57, and that means that the worker had to work four minutes in order to buy a loaf of bread. By 2022, the price of bread increased to $1.56, but the hourly wage increased to $26.87. So our worker now only has to work three minutes in order to buy a loaf of bread. So bread got 25% cheaper, and we don't have to adjust for inflation. The point is that there is a huge difference between price of bread increasing in 212%, which is what you see in the newspapers, and the reality, which is that bread actually got 25% cheaper. Okay. So, what happened to resource prices during the age of globalization between 1980 and 2018? What we found by looking at 50 different uh, types of resources we found that on average, the time price decreased by almost 72%, which means that um, instead of one unit in the basket of commodities, you can now get 3.52. You have 2.5 more than you had back in 1980. Pork internationally declined in price by almost 85%, which means that you can get six and a half pounds of pork for the price of one back in 1980. And some people ask, is this pace of progress fast enough? Peter Thiel, for example, 
uh, says that we are not growing at a fast pace. But what I would argue that in this period of globalization, where we have seen time prices fall by 72% and our abundance increase by 250%, that this was the fastest growth in resource abundance, fastest growth in prosperity ever measured on Earth. For thousands of years, we've been on the planet for about 300,000 years, for thousands of years, your living standard would be equal to those of your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren. Standard of living was completely static. In the last 48 years, 38 years, we have seen abundance of resources increase by almost, well, 250% or 3.25. So my point is that we are living in an increasingly abundant world. Okay, now let's look at these prices from the perspective of uh, individual countries. As you can see, China performs incredibly well. Time prices in China fell by almost 98%, which means that instead of one unit in our basket of commodities, the Chinese now get 40. Chinese abundance has grown by almost 4,000%. Their growth was 10% per year, which means that in China, abundance doubles every seven years. Every seven years, you are becoming twice as well off as you were before. India has done very well. Portugal didn't expect to see that. Australia, on average, you have 72% decline in time prices, which means that on average, the world has grown about 3.5%, doubling every 20 years. United States, Chile, Spain, Peru, Brazil. Okay? Not the best performer, but not the worst performer. Your abundance has grown of, at a faster pace than the United Kingdom, Argentina, not surprises there, Canada, France, and Mexico. In Brazil, time prices of commodities fell by 68%. So you're growing at about 3% a year, which means that your abundance doubles every 23 years or so. So in our book, we looked at, we looked at 18 different data sets. On, uh, on the horizontal line, what you get is a change in population. Increase in population is here. Increase is in abundance is here. We looked at 18 different data sets. We looked at fuel, food, metals, minerals. We even looked at some services. And not in a single case did something become less abundant. Everything is becoming more abundant. But that's not all. If abundance and population grew at the same rate, all of our data would fall on this 45% line. In fact, what we found with 18 different data sets is that abundance is increasing at a faster pace than population. Every single dot on this graph, that's not a single commodity, that's a data set which contains dozens, sometimes 50 different commodities, looking at different periods of time. And in every case, we find that abundance is increasing at a faster pace than population. And that's what we call superabundance in our work. So remember this chart, which so frightened Malthus? The reality looks something like this. Malthus thought that population would be growing at a faster pace than resources. But the reality is that resources are growing at a much faster rate than population. And the difference between these two rates, that's new knowledge. Knowledge produced in the human mind. Or as the American economist Thomas Sowell put it, 
The cavemen had the same natural resources at their disposal as we have today, and the difference between their standard of living and ours is the knowledge that they could bring to bear on those resources and the knowledge that we have today. In our model, the process of knowledge creation starts with the overall population. Data suggests that only a small fraction of humanity invents or innovates anything. So the bigger the population you have, the more likely there are going to be people in it who are going to invent or innovate anything. Like, for example, the Scottish pastor Patrick Bell, who in 1828 developed the reaping machine. Then, over the next 200 years, his reaping machine got innovated in the market, in capitalism, until you end up with the modern combine harvester, which ensures that our uh, shelves in the supermarkets are filled with loads of uh, affordable bread. Of course, population is not the only answer to superabundance. If population was the only thing that mattered, China would have been the richest country for the last 2,000 years, because for the last 2,000 years, China has been the world's richest country. But it was only after liberalization in the 1970s, when the creative potential of the Chinese people was unleashed, that China was turned from a very poor country into a very rich country. So superabundance is really a result of population times freedom. So our book talks about an infinitely bountiful planet which may seem somewhat counterintuitive, given that the world really has only a limited or finite number of atoms. In fact, most people would agree with the American environmentalist Kenneth Balding, who said that anyone who believes in an indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. But the number of atoms is not all that matters. In fact, number of atoms matters very little. This is a Lamborghini Huracan worth 220,000 American dollars. And this is a Lamborghini Huracan worth $5,000. Note that the number of atoms is pretty much the same, but they've been arranged differently. The first arrangement was intelligent, the second arrangement chaotic. So by arranging atoms in an increasingly intelligent way, we can get more value from the same atoms or from previously useless atoms. The grain of sand, for example, has been lying around the world for billions of years, completely useless. About four and a half thousand years ago, someone figured out that by heating sand to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, you can turn it into glass beads, which men and women in the past used as decoration. Then later, somebody realized that you can use sand or glass in order to create cups. Then later, we used it in window panes. And with every step of the way, the value added from glass has increased. Today, we use glass in microchips, which power civilization, and in fiber optic cables, which make humanity much more productive. So to get infinite value from a finite number of atoms, all that is required is new knowledge. And new knowledge, unlike atoms, is potentially unlimited. Or as Paul Romer, the American economist, put it, we consistently fail to grasp how many ideas remain to be discovered. The difficulty is the same that we have with compounding. Possibilities do not add up, they multiply. So I've been talking a lot about atoms, and I want to show you an example. This is a periodic table. It contains 
hundred different, um, um, hundred different types of elements. To create a two compound, or rather two element compound, takes up to 10,000 different calculations. 100 times 99, right? And if you combine copper and tin, what do you get? The Bronze Age, which happened about 5,000 years ago. But it took us 300,000 years to figure out that if you combine copper and tin, you get bronze. What happens if you combine four different elements? Well, the number of calculations is 94 million. So for that, you need a lot of time and a lot of, a lot of people. When you get to 10 element compounds, there are more possible combinations, 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 times 90, 95, etc. There are more possible combinations than the number of seconds that have expired since the Big Bang started 14 billion years ago. So as you can see, knowledge that we can still come up with in this world is potentially unlimited. There have simply not been enough time and enough people since we showed up 300,000 years ago to but scratch the surface of potential knowledge that can still be discovered. So let me conclude by drawing on the following analogy. If we are correct, the world is a closed system. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> we have it. So what, what are the threats to superabundance? Well, the first one is a decline in population. You open a newspaper, you switch on television, you are being told that having a child is a, an act of selfishness because children produce a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. You are told that the future is going to be horrible. And obviously, if we are not going to have people in the world, if the population is going to decline, then there are going to be fewer ideas. Our economic growth is going to suffer as a result. Another problem is a decline in political freedom. Throughout advanced nations, we have huge problems with freedom of speech. Why is freedom of speech important? Freedom of speech is important on both micro and macro level. On a micro level, it allows two people to communicate to come up with new ideas, new inventions. I must be free to communicate with Alan or Ivan, to change ideas freely, to publish them, to invest in the marketplace, and then to profit from it. So freedom is very important, and it's also important on a macro level. If our governments prohibit free speech, we cannot tell them, we cannot tell them that the world, that, that the country is going in the, right, in, in the wrong direction. Why did communism survive in Eastern Europe for so long? Because they didn't have freedom of speech. They couldn't say, no, we are going the wrong direction. So we have to have both growing number of people and also we have to maintain our political freedom. And of course, we cannot allow for the continuation and decline of economic freedom. Markets work because they separate bad ideas from good ideas. Markets are incredibly important part of the knowledge creation process because they separate from valuable, valuable ideas and valueless ideas. And if the government comes in and puts its finger on the scale and says that you should invest in that area or that area, well then that messes up the entire process of new knowledge creation. Knowledge creation today in the world is limited to six or seven countries, all of them very free. The rest of the world basically uses the knowledge produced in free countries. But if freedom declines throughout the world, then that is a problem. So anyway, I want to conclude by drawing the following analogy. If we are correct, the writers of superabundance, then the world is a closed system with finite number of atoms in the same way that a piano is a closed system. The piano has 88 keys, but those keys can be played in an infinite variety of ways. And the same is true of the planet. The Earth's atoms may be fixed, 
but the possible combinations and recombinations of those atoms are infinite. So what matters is not the physical limits of our planet, but human freedom to experiment and reimagine the use of the resources that we have. Thank you very much. Marion, thank you very much. Uh, let's start now the Q&A questions. And first of all, I would like to know how do you define freedom? And how does that definition relate to your vision of a world of abundance? Um, so I define freedom in sort of Berlinian way. I differentiate between positive and negative type of freedom. And I'm a huge believer in, in negative freedom, which is basically that allowing people to, getting out of people's way, allowing them to use their God-given talents, uh, whatever talents they've been born with, uh, in order to uh, accomplish their goals, to maximize their own happiness, uh, their own meaning, um, um, uh, to, 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 to get rich, and that of their families. So very much a negative definition of freedom. Just let people be themselves without, uh, without other people imposing on them. And I think that's very important to superabundance because um, throughout human history, you can take it 12,000 years ago to the start of the agricultural revolution. Um, People have never been free from other people telling them what to do. Uh, we had slavery. We had uh, women uh, who were basically a property of men. So that's, that's already a large section of the population that couldn't really be themselves, but they had to do something that somebody else told them. And as a result of that, uh, we didn't have much economic growth. I mean, that's part of the reason why we didn't have economic growth, because a lot of people couldn't apply themselves. But even in modern Europe, where you didn't have slavery and women started having rights, you still have governments organizing all sorts of monopolies, uh, who can import this, who can import that. Um, but it's only in the last 200 years that people got more negative freedom. They were allowed to do with their lives whatever they wanted. And I think it is telling that this huge shift upwards in terms of abundance happens in the last 200 years when you have more people, but also more people who are free. Great. And what should be the government's role in, first, solving global problems, and second, in the promotion of human progress? Well, I think that human progress does depend very much on uh, uh, the protection of life, liberty, and property. And uh, I'm, I'm not an anarchist. I, I, some of my best friends are anarchists, but I'm not one of them. And consequently, um, I think that there is a role of government in supplying those basic uh, night watchman um, duties so that, so that business can take place. Uh, when it comes to the world, um, look, um, I, I, I think there is, uh, we, we still have problems with um, uh, commons. Uh, be it common air or water and whatever, the governments aren't particularly good at doing that, but, but they can perform some valuable duties. For example, 7% um, of the world's oceans is now protected from overfishing, and that was an international treaty. Um, also, when it comes to the ozone layer, that was an international treaty which uh, prohibited certain chemicals from being, being emitted into the air. So I, th I think that governments can, can probably do can potentially do more good than, than, than harm uh, when it comes to global commons. Thank you. And what are the negative effect, effects that technology can have on freedom and progress in society? Well, you know, uh, um, the last 200 years are really a story of technological innovation. Um, you can think about economic growth as Smithian growth, named after Adam Smith, or Schumpeterian growth, named after Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist. And basically, for the longest time, uh, we, we, we got richer by basically division of labor and increasing the factors of production. So Smithian growth is one where if you want to grow more wheat or corn, uh, maize, you just get more people with shovels and more land and more capital, and that's how you grow it, right? Um, um, and, and that has its role. It's very important. But Schumpeterian growth is all about technology. So instead of adding more people or more land, 
maybe you can genetically modify certain crops so that you can get higher yield on fewer acres of land. Uh, the beauty of, of, um, of, uh, of, of Schumpeterian growth is that it has been primarily responsible for the tremendous growth in global economy and standards of living over the last 200 years. People have always innovated, but usually those periods of innovations just sort of went up and down. They sort of petered out. The beauty of the last 200 years is that we are living in a period of, of, of continuous innovation, and, and we need to keep that going. So innovation is very important, and uh, uh, te technological innovation is very important. Now, of course, technology, uh, there is no technology, uh, all technologies can be used for good and evil, and we just have to live with that, I'm afraid. Yes, and now I want to talk about globalization. So in your opinion, how important is globalization to the superabundance effect? Um, I think it's incredibly important, and, and the data certainly suggests that the world, especially developing countries, have done very well uh, after globalization starts after 1980. So that's been a uh, positive good. But remember, globalization has different components. Uh, two of the most important components is free trade and multinational um, corporations. Why are those important? Is because uh, you can do one of two things. It, it, l l let's say that we are talking about Brazil. You've got this extraordinarily productive agricultural sector and you are importing a lot of technology, agricultural technology from the United States, right? Which makes you more productive, right? Now you could spend a lot of money, of taxpayers' money, trying to reverse engineer the American uh, technology and try to make it at home, but you would spend a lot of taxpayers' money you might not get it right. I mean, after all, Brazil tried to do import substitution in the 1970s and 1980s, not entirely successful. The point is that you are importing all this technology thereby becoming more productive, and that's a good thing. The other thing is that multinational corporate investment is very important, because if you have international companies working in your country, they bring with them a lot of tacit knowledge which they can pass on to the local native population and therefore make them more productive. So yes, uh, globalization is a is very important aspect of, of superabundance. Great. And you told us about pessimism. So pessimists, even though it's scary people, always seems to have a bigger appeal and audience around it. Why people are so pessimistic, and how does this feeling hijack our future? Uh, well, I think because we have evolved to be pessimistic, the world was a much more horrible place uh, than currently is. So a pessimist, uh, the genes of a pessimist would get passed on, whereas if you were an optimist, you probably got eaten by a lion, right? So if you are walking through a bush and then you hear a sound. Uh, if you're a pessimist, you run away. If you're an optimist, you say, it's okay, but if it's a lion, then you got, you got taken out of the gene pool. So pessimism was very important uh, for survival of our species. Uh, but of course, the world has changed, but our genes have not. And so we continue to be interested in all the horrible news, all the negative news, and we ignore all the positive news, even though there is much more positive news than negative news. Um, if it bleeds, it leads. Newspapers always lead with the most horrific story they can come up with. But it gets worse than that. And that is that because of competition of different media um, and, and the rise of the internet, um, the, 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 the headlines uh, and the content has become much more negative. In other words, for every additional negative word in the title of the article, you are increasing the number of clicks that you are going to get. And that drives the, 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 the emotional content of all articles down uh, to, to, toward negativity, because that's what sells. Yes. Now, th there's nothing that you can do about it, because you cannot change your genes, I cannot change mine. But if you are aware that the media is playing games with your brain, then that's part of the solution. You have to know that, that that headline is there as a clickbait. They're trying to get me to click on it. Yes, not that good, right? And what's your opinion regarding the negative effects of superabundance, such as obesity, 
digital distraction and climate change? Well, I think that whenever you have a technological solution to something, or rather, whenever you move society forward, new problems appear. So, for really, since the beginning of our species, if you believe in the theory of evolution, and I do, what are animals obsessed with? They are obsessed with eating, not being eaten, and having sex, right? And so we were animals, we, we still are, but we are intelligent animals. And those were exactly our, um, uh, what we wanted. And um, now I lost, oh yeah. And, and so being hungry was something that everybody experienced at all times. We got rid of that problem. Yes, there are still hungry people in the world, but famines have disappeared and most people have a problem with obesity, right? Once again, the world has changed, we have more food, but our genes have not changed, therefore we overeat. So it's a problem, and smart people have been working on it, and now in the United States we finally have injections and pills which allow you to basically eat less uh, and, and lose a lot of weight. But it, it took some, some time, so yes, the human progress brings with it certain negative uh, circumstances. Also, same with global warming. Um, because of fossil fuel use, we were able to get from poverty to riches, but it created a problem, CO2 emissions. How do we solve it? Well, we could build nuclear power plants. Does Brazil have nuclear power plants? No. You should. <laughs> because nuclear power plants don't produce any CO2 into the atmosphere. It's the perfect fuel. Um, Germany is pulling their nuclear power plants down. Why? Because of green extremist ideology. It doesn't make any sense. No. Not at all. So, Marian, you have a very optimistic view about the future. As we are closing this Forum da Liberdade, could you please give a final message to the audience, a very positive message to us? Well, people sometimes say that I'm an optimist, but I think that um, at best I'm a rational optimist, but I really think of myself as a realist. I think of myself as a realist because the world is in a much better shape than most people appreciate. Once you stop reading the headlines and you start looking at trend lines and statistics, you realize that the world is in a much better place. Yes, we are animals, but we are intelligent animals. Yes, we consume, but we also create. And so, I think that humans have created this wonderful world full of superabundance, and it's only going to improve so long as we keep a solutionist mindset, that when there's a problem, we solve it. I'm not saying that I have an answer to every problem. I'm sure there are certain things that I don't have an answer to, but, when you look at the problems which we have managed to tackle before, there is no reason why we cannot resolve problems in the future. So, I'm an optimist about human beings. I think that human beings are on balance positive for the world. And so the more beings, human beings, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marian.